God bless you. It's great to be with you once again here. Um, as it is written, Bible study. Callie, can you please open with prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and how you have freely given it unto us so that we may know you and that we may know also who we are and all that you've made available to us in this day and time. Thank you for your word that we're going to hear tonight and how it will inspire us to greater action, Father. Thank you for <coughs> your love for us and for <coughs> us abounding in it more and more. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, the point that we've been covering is going from grace to victory and not allowing ourselves to become complacent or stuck in a rut. And the key to that is really the applied word of God. Our dog's got a little squeak toy. <laughs> Excuse me. Not, not, in order to not be complacent or stuck in a rut, we've got to really put the word into application. It's essential for all that we do. And you can go anywhere and not hear the word taught. You can... Go hear it taught and not apply it. 
See, the key to the fact, the key to this is that we're doing something with what we're taught. That's the key issue: is taking the word that we're learning and putting it into practical application in our daily lives. As simple as prayer. When we hear, "Hey, pray," so we should be praying on a regular basis. But what about studying God's word? How many of us really get into the scriptures and trying to figure out what God's point of view is. I'm thankful to be able to teach. I'm thankful to have this open door. I'm thankful that God put it on my heart and my wife's heart. But we also need other people to rise up to the point where they're studying the word for themselves, where they're putting it into application and seeing the success because of it. I've been reading in the Old Testament a lot recently in how they, first of all, Israel, they really sucked. <laughs> Let's just be point blank. I am astonished at how patient God was. Now, when you go to the Old Testament and you're reading about Israel, we have to really have a mature mindset here. I think we're expecting some people to walk in the door in a second. Come on in. She just came to see the puppy. Hello, you guys. So, we're in, we're in the uh, Old Testament, and we got to have a mature mindset because in the Old Testament, we have to understand they did not know, they did not fully understand their adversary. And... So they, whenever you read Lord throughout the Old Testament, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's referring to God. There's a Hebrew idiom of permission in there where God allows things to happen because of a lack of faith or unbelief. So we got to have a mature mindset when we go read some of these things in the Old Testament that we can never attribute evil to God. That's a no-no. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we've got to have that first and foremost. But when I was reading about Israel, man, they blew it. They really sucked at times. They would walk for a little bit. And then, you know what happened is they worshipped mankind. They ended up falling for the tricks of the worldly things, the worldly lusts, the worldly desires. And we're going to read about some of that here in the book of Judges. So if you turn to Judges chapter 3, what I realized through all of this is whenever we reach up to God, whenever we reach to God, the one thing that we will absolutely find out and realize is His arm has always been extended to us. It's always been there, waiting for us to reach out to Him. So this really hit me with this record of Israel <clears throat> because we're going to see how many times they blew it. And every time they cried out to God, he was there. He was there. I would have done that. <laughs> you know, it's like, you guys are idiots. You, how many chances do you need to get this thing right throughout the years? You know, this is after Moses. This is after Joshua. And... So, you know, there's got to be some kind of learning, some kind of history to learn some of those mistakes, but they didn't do it. So this kind of tells you where mankind was and why we needed a Redeemer, why we needed the Deliverer in life. So let's look at Judges chapter 3. <clears throat> and the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites and Amorites and the Perizzites, I guess, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So that's not a good thing. That's not God's will. That's not what God desired for them at all. And they took their daughters to be wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served what? Their, their gods. So they're forsaking the God of Israel 
the one true God. They are forsaking him and they're serving other gods. Well, we see this in the world today, don't we? We see that this nation that was really designed under God is got many gods. And so that's a predicament. Verse 7, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So this is a repetitive thing with them. Year after year, it seems like. So they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God. So, you know, we talk about using, taking the Lord's name in vain, so to speak. Forget where, where that record is. But this is the Lord's name in vain pretty much right here. It's not about the words that somebody allows to come out of their mouth. They knew God and they forsook God. They knew who he was. And yet, they're going off to serve other gods and do great evil. They forgot him. And they served Balaam and the groves. I'm not going to tell you what groves are, but it's not a good thing. It's a very dirty, devilish worshiping of idols, a form of idols. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So we know God is good always. We know that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So there's got to be a figure of speech in here that needs to be researched. So figure that out. There's Hebrew idiom of permission. There's probably other idioms in here. There's probably other Orientalisms in here because it's an Eastern book. And the Eastern culture needs to be understood. So, and it goes on. And they were sold into the hand of that guy with the really ridiculously long, unpronounceable name for me. For eight years. For eight years. So, do you think that they're prisoners? Yeah. They're in bondage. But look at this. They put their hands up. And they're like... And when Israel, the children of Israel, cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. He's always there, waiting for us to get our head out of our rear and realize, hello, I've been here waiting for you. See, when we're going to get out of the rut that maybe we've been in or been complacent, in order for us to continue to progress from stage to stage maturely, in our spiritual level where we want to go with God, man, there's times that we got to just cry out to God. He's there. So if I'm stuck right now in a rut, it, now is my opportunity in every moment after that to cry out to my God because His hand is always there. It's always there. So... We're going from grace to victory. And this is part of that, is realizing that God's arm of protection, God's arm of victory is always there. He raised up a deliverer, the deliverer, our redeemer, Jesus Christ. He's always there. Now we have Christ in us. Now it's, I've got to realize this. Now I've got to cry out to him with that victory in my mind, knowing that he has delivered me. And it's a past tense reality. So they do this again. What check, what verse were we in? We were. Oh, and that really long nine. one. We're in verse eight. So verse nine, they raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them. Even Othniel, I don't even know how to say that. The son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So there's the deliverer. Verse 10, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. So, in the beginning of all of this, the cause of the majority of what happened to Israel is 
when they were going out to war to claim their land and all the things that God promised the chosen people, Israel, he chose them. And they were supposed to destroy all of it and leave it. They took it for themselves. They didn't do what God instructed them to do. Instead, they took it. And that's, they flat out disobeyed what God had instructed them to do. Why would God instruct them to do these things? Because they're seeds that get planted. Somebody asked me the other day why, basically why certain things happen. Why um, does evil happen? Why is this person this way? And all I can tell you is it only takes a seed planted in one's mind. It could be, as a young kid, you're not good enough. And that seed gets nourished. Whether it's a school teacher that says, You'll, you're, you're not going to make it. That happened to my daughter. And that sucks. Because Emma was told by a teacher that she wasn't going to pass a class. That she should just drop out. And she came to me and asked. And I said, you got to decide. Don't let somebody else decide your future for you. So that little seed gets nourished. And then later on in life, people become what that seed was allowed to be. Right? So we got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Let's keep reading. And the, <clears throat> verse 10, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. See, he did what God instructed to do. And the Lord delivered that guy, the really long, ridiculous name, into the king of whatever, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against him. Verse 11. And the land had rest. The land had rest. See, Jesus Christ is our peace. Therefore, we have rest with God. There's never a time when we don't have this other than our own infliction. You know, our self-infliction of whatever's going on. But God's always there. And when we realize that as we reach up to Him, that hand's always there, reaching out. Reaching back towards us. <clears throat> well, this goes on throughout this chapter. And you can continue to read where Israel blew it. Then they cried out to God for a deliverer. He sent a deliverer. They overcame. Then there was rest. And then they did the same silly thing over again. So you know what that says? We're all human. And that's going to happen. We're going to prevail at times. There's going to be times when we're getting our butt kicked because we're not paying attention. And then we cry out to God and he's there. And he's there. But the point of the matter is, keep reaching out to God. Keep crying out to God. Because in Christ, we have a Redeemer and a Deliverer. Don't you come over here. All right, let's turn to Colossians and I'll close out here. I just wanted to cover this briefly. Well... Turn to Colossians. I just want to finish reading this. Judges 3.27 says, And it came to pass when he was come that he... Well, I, gotta, I guess i got to back up. Judges. Judges. Yeah, let's go back. I want to read that. Sorry. I want to, I want to finish reading this because this is kind of cool. So, this is Israel blows it again. Right? I do want to read this record. And then they cry out to the Lord. This is, let's look at verse 15. 
But when the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, the Lord raised up them up a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a, Benjamite, a man left-handed. Now I want to tell you how very detailed God is. We're going to read about it. This is pretty gory and disgusting. But if you ever wondered if God gets detailed in his word, it's going to come up right here. And by him the children of Israel sent a present under Elgon, Eglon, sorry, I looked at that backwards, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So that's already crazy detailed. And I'm sure the right thigh has something to do with a blessing, right? Being on the right. And he brought the present to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Eglon was very, a very fat <coughs> man. He was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself, this is Eglon, turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood with him went out from him. Right? So everybody left. But he himself turned again from the quarries. Oh, I read that. And, and Ehud came unto him came unto him and he was sitting in the summer parlor which he had for himself alone so he has this summer parlor that there's nobody else allowed in it but him but he takes this other guy that's got a secret to tell him and Ehud said I have a message from God unto thee and he arose out of his seat. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took. Well, that's why he was the right hand, right? Because he's left handed, remember? Mm -hmm. So, but I still wonder if it has something to do with blessing. Because if I'm left handed, it's almost easier here. But who knows? It'd be something cool to look into. Right? But you'll see what he does here. This is pretty cool. Uh, where did I leave off? I have a message from God. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took his dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. So he's whoosh, straight in. That's how I read it anyway. He thrust it into his belly. And the haft, which is the part that... Uh, stops your hand from going onto the blade, it went in also. Oh, man. It went in also. And the haft went in also after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade. Is that not detailed? I think that's pretty detailed. So that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. That's how far in that thing went. He couldn't draw it out. And the dirt came out. Did it say how long? It said that it was like a cubit somewhere in there that I read. Okay. Sorry. Verse 16 says it was two edges of a cubit length. So we'll have to figure that out, right? Exactly how long that is. But it went all the way in and his hands in his belly now because that's, and he can't get this thing out. And the fat curled around it. I mean, it's, he's a big guy. And the dirt came out. And Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And he did that because they, it was basically tricking the guards because he would go in there and shut the door to be alone. 
So he escapes, right? And and verse 27, and it came to pass when he had come, when he was come, he this is back home, he blew the trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him upon from the mount, and he before them. And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. See, look at the victory that's wrought. Every time we reach for God and we just, you know, the word has great boundaries within it to help us have an understanding of how to stay out of trouble. You know, more than anything, it's how to stay out of trouble and heartache. It can no longer, our mindset can no longer be about the consciousness of sin, condemnation. It can't be about those things. Not being good enough. We are good enough. There's therefore now no condemnation. There's no consciousness of sins. Can't be about those things. So we've got to say, okay, what next? Well, now I have the word that helps keep me out of trouble. It helps keep me moving forward. You know, that's what those boundaries in God's word are really for because we've been redeemed. Now we're going to Colossians chapter 1. So we've got to keep growing in our knowledge and understanding of God's word so that there's no doubt in our mind on who we are and what we can do as God's children. There's no doubt. But we also can't be distracted, so distracted by the things of the world that we just get beat up and defeated at times. Now, I'm not saying that we're not going to have our challenges. Everybody's got their challenges. But we don't want to self-inflict our, you know, be self-inflicting when we can avoid it, when God has the solution, when it's in God's word. And, you know, it's really about our walk. It's really just about our walk. But if we can hold our heads up high and not allow the trick of the adversary to condemn us and to beat us up, the world does that enough, or they try, but we that's part of the adversary's thing. So we gotta really convince our mind that no, I'm a son of God. It's no. No, Muggsy. She still has something in her mouth. The joys of having a new puppy. Anyway, Colossians 1 verse 9 is where we will close. It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this is our goal. This is our purpose right here. This is where we want to continue to press to and continue to grow spiritually. For this purpose, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Well, you are pleasing unto the Lord, right? It's that we are pleasing unto the Lord. We already are. But this stuff keeps us out of trouble. Increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto patience or endurance and long-suffering with joyfulness. See, it doesn't matter what happens in life. The adversary is going to attack at some point. We've got to keep reaching out to God because we just can't always do it on our own. So our deliverer is there. We have Christ in us, but God is always there. It's Christ in you. But keep crying out to God because every time we do, deliverance is right there. And it's throughout the Old Testament with Israel. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us adequate. Meat is adequate to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath delivered us out from the power of darkness. Here is our great deliverer. Here is our great redeemer. As we cry out to God, to claim this promise. You know, fear happens for 
Two basic reasons. One, somebody doesn't know the word, doesn't know the promises of God. Then fear creeps in. Or two, one's not claiming the promises of God. Because when we claim the promises of God, there's no reason for fear. There's no reason for fear. We have been delivered out from the power of darkness. And, hath, and we have been translated into the kingdom by his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So it's a done deal. We've got to keep moving from grace to victory in life. We've got to get out of ruts that, that sometimes we get stuck in by reaching up to God and claiming who we are. Claim those promises of victory and deliverance because we have been given the ultimate deliverer in Christ. Lori, will you have a prayer? Yes. Well, Father, thank you so much for what a privilege it is to be your called out sons and daughters. Thank you so much for what you did for us with your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for that accomplished work that it is complete, it is finished. All we need to do is accept and know it in our hearts to be true that you are our Father, and you have had that wall of partition brought down, that we are whole, we are delivered, and we are mighty on your side, Father. So I thank you for the word just continuing to minister to our hearts. I thank you for that it is doing exactly, going exactly where you sent it to, Father. And I thank you again for what a comfort it is to know that we have you, and we can lean inside the palm of your hands, Father. So I thank you for this. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. God bless. We love you. Thank you for being a part of this. And we will see you next Thursday.